A university was preparing to name a new prof uh, president, and they had narrowed down the choices to a mathematician, a philosopher, and an alternative dispute resolution professional. They decided to uh, have a board meeting where they would have one question asked to these people, and based on the question, they would make their selection. So they bring the mathematician in first, and they ask him a basic question. What's one and one? The mathematician, who is a very concrete thinker, thinks about it for a second and says, one and one is two. Next, they bring the philosopher in. Same question, what's one and one? The philosopher, being a more abstract thinker, thinks, says, uh, well, that's uh, two plus or minus one. Okay? Next, they bring the ADR professional and ask him the same question, what's one and one? The ADR professional closes all the windows, draws all the shades, locks all the doors, bends over the table, and if he's a mediator, he says, what do you want it to be? But if he's an arbitrator, he says, let me tell you what it's going to be. And that's the difference between mediation and arbitration. I'm here today to talk about arbitration. My name is Larry Sychek. I'm a transactional attorney. I've been practicing law since 1980. My practice is basically business and real estate, and I'm a CPA, which is an interesting skill set to bring to the arbitration profession where most arbitrators have a litigation background. I don't. I've been doing arbitration since about uh, 1995, 1994. I'm on the AAA panel. I'm also on the panel of the National Arbitration Forum, and I'm formerly an NASD, now FINRA, arbitrator. It's a little bit about my background. But let's talk about arbitration because that's what we're here to talk about today. Arbitration is a technique for resolving disputes outside the court system whereby the parties agree to be bound by a decision, called the award, rendered by a neutral third party. This decision, which follows either a hearing or a submission of documents, is legally binding and the award is enforceable in a court of law. Arbitration is often used to resolve commercial disputes in consumer and employment matters, and has been and continues to gain popularity in resolving disputes stemming from international commercial transactions. Uh, there is a movement away from arbitration in commercial matters because there's a perceived bias against the consumer. Uh, a lot of uh, con uh, companies have put arbitration clauses in their contracts and have uh, required consumers to arbitrate and there's a movement away from that because, again, of the perceived bias. In fact, there was an organization called the National Arbitration Forum. I was on their panel. And they got into a little bit of trouble because the, uh, the company that was representing the, um, the law firm, rather, that was representing the company bringing these actions, it uh, was discovered, had an ownership interest in the National Arbitration Forum, a clear conflict of interest. They were sanctioned by the state of Minnesota. Uh, they were put down for a while. The National Arbitration Forum is back and operating, but uh, that really put a damper on the perception of arbitration being fair to consumers. So that uh, goes to credibility. Now, why arbitrate? The AAA, the American Arbitration Association, will tell you that it's better, faster, and cheaper, and it can be. As an example, I was on an arbitration panel a few years ago, $35 million claim, $8 million counterclaim. The case, from beginning to end, took about 18 months. Now, if you think about it, if that case going to trial with appeals would have taken three to four years. The parties were thrilled with the fact that they, it got done quickly and efficiently at a reasonable cost, and everyone walked away happy, except for one party that had lost the case. But that's not why they were unhappy. Uh, it wasn't because of the process. It was because of the result. Uh, arbitration can be either voluntary or mandatory. No person and no body can require you to arbitrate without there being a statutory or contact a contractual requirement. Read contracts before you sign them. Tell your family to read contracts before you sign them. Because if the contract calls for arbitration, you will waive your right to go to court if you sign the, that contract, and courts have uniformly found that arbitration will be compelled if there is a contractual provision to arbitrate contained in the operable agreement between the parties. Arbitration clauses and contracts should be carefully drafted. 
Items to address in an arbitration clause include a venue for the hearing and choice of law, the form of award, confidentia confidentiality of arbitration as to the parties. The arbitrator is ethically compelled to remain confidential, the parties are not. In fact, I did an arbitration a few years ago where after the case was over, I read an article in the Daily Business Review about the case that I had ruled upon. I didn't, I didn't go to the public, but one of the parties did because they were happy with the result. Uh, you want to conclude the rules and scope of discovery, if there is some benefit to deviate from the administrator's rules. Uh, the number of arbitrators should be mentioned in the clause. Uh, the more arbitrators, obviously, the more the cost. And whether an expedited process can be employed uh, the American Arbitration Association, for example, has an expedited process and in circ circumstances where you might have a 50-50 partnership uh, between two people, they may need a, an expedited result in order to continue their business operating in an efficient manner. That can be, that can be had if you allow those expedited rules and, and call for them in your arbitration clause. Uh, again, arbitration can be binding or non-binding. A binding arbitration is fairly clear. You get an award, it's enforceable, and a discussion. Non-binding means that the parties go through the process and obtain a ruling. However, the parties do not necessarily have to abide by that ruling. Why would you do it? Because it provides a guide to the parties as to how a neutral third party, and by extension a judge or a jury, might react to the matter as presented. Now in some Florida courts, Broward County for example, a judge might send parties to non-binding arbitration with the proviso that if the losing party chooses to proceed to a subsequent trial and loses again a trial, that losing party may be subject to some sanctions, such as paying the winning party's attorney's fees and costs. So now, you've agreed to arbitrate and the process begins. Uh, starting with preliminary matters. Arbitrations can be administered through different organizations or by private parties. Some of the organizations include the American Arbitration Association, one of the oldest administrators of arbitrations. They, they were in business since 1926. Uh, JAMS, which is relatively new to the South Florida area, has been here a couple of years. Uh, the big complaint about them is they tend to be more expensive than the AAA. Uh, CPR Arbitration is another group that does arbitration. FINRA, which you mentioned earlier, they handle securities cases. And of course, there's private arbitration, uh, which would typically be administered by the arbitrator himself. There are people out there you can contact and they will do an arbitration for you as long as it's by stipulation and agreement between the parties. How does it start? Well, like a court case, an arbitra arbitration begins with the filing of a demand by the claimant. The man, the man can be answered by the, filing, by the filing of an answer by the respondent. A respondent can also file a counterclaim or a motion to dismiss, just like in a court proceeding. Uh, a response of pleading need not be filed in arbitration. Some of the rules of the AAA, for instance, uh, would automatically deny any claim if the respondent doesn't file anything. Interesting point, you cannot get a default judgment in arbitration. You have to go through the process, even if the other party doesn't show up. Uh, I've been in situations where the other party didn't show up and I made the claimant prove their case uh, and, and before I made a ruling in their favor. Uh, now with these filings, the administrative body will ask the parties to file lists of involved individuals and companies so the arbitrator to be selected can check for any conflicts. The process, the neutrality of the arbitrator is crucial to the process, so the arbitrator is required to disclose even the slightest of connection with any party or potential witness so that the parties can make an informed decision as to whether they have concerns about the neutrality of the arbitrator selected. Uh, this disclosure obligation continues throughout the arbitration process. Meaning if, that's, if something comes up later where you discover another witness or discover some connection, you are compelled as an arbitrator to let the parties know uh, it doesn't go away. Uh, as an example, I was uh, chosen as an arbitrator last year on a case and it was a three-person panel. Uh, I had ruled previously in a previous case uh, in a matter where I served on the panel and ruled as to one of the parties. 
I disclosed that up front. Neither party objected. The panel was seated. We moved forward with the case. Uh, during the discovery process, one of the parties decided to submit my award, the award I had written, uh, which favored them, as an exhibit to, to, the, uh, to some of their, their documents. When the other party realized that I had written an award in favor of the one party, they immediately said, get rid of that guy. And uh, with, with that disclosure, I was, uh, I was taken off the panel and replaced. Uh, I'll give you another example of, of something that's happened in the past. Um, an arbitrator was selected by the AAA to handle a case expeditiously, had to, had to have a hearing right away. Uh, they had a telephonic conference in which the arbitrator disclosed to, that he had connections with both sides of the case, being friends with relatives on one side and knowing that one side and then having business relationships and acquaintances on the other side as well. The parties listened to the disclosure, met separately with the AAA administrator, and decided to move forward with the case. The arbitrator ruled, and the party that was the, the arbitrator ruled against tried to overturn the award based upon the fact that in their opinion, retrospectively, the arbitrator's disclosure was not adequate. It was, didn't go far enough. It didn't talk about the relationship enough. Uh, it was overturned on, it, uh, on the uh, lower level, went to appeal, and the appellate court came back and said, no, 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 you don't get two bites out of the apple. The arbitrator made the disclosure. It was incumbent upon the parties to question the nature of the relationship once the relationship was disclosed. And that's case law on that. Uh, you can look it up. Okay, how do you select the arbitrators? Typically, the parties will be provided with a slate of potential arbitrators selected by the, the administrator based on their backgrounds and the subject matter of the case. If the parties are unable to agree on a panel or an arbitrator, the administrator will make that selection. Arbitrations can be presided over by a sole arbitrator or a panel of three arbitrators. Uh, larger, more complex cases will tend to have a panel, while smaller and less complex cases will tend to have a sole arbitrator. Because the parties are sharing the cost of the arbitrators, costs may be a factor in determining whether there will be one or three arbitrators. Another means of selection is for each party to select an arbitrator, who would be called the party appointed arbitrator, and then the two party appointed arbitrators would select the third member of the panel, and that third member would typically be the, uh, the chair of the panel. Uh, very important that it's understood by the three members of the panel whether they're going to be neutral or non-neutral. The party appointed, if they're non-neutral, it becomes, in my opinion, very inefficient. I've been in the situation where I've been a chair in, with two non-neutrals, and what happens is you hear the case from the attorneys, and then you go in to deliberate, and you hear the case again from the non-neutral party appointed uh, arbitrators who are, in essence, lobbying for the position of the party that's paying them. So I don't like that, uh, that type of a structure. I don't have a problem if the, if the parties are, are neutral. And I've been in situations where I have been selected by a party, but to be a neutral arbitrator and have, along with another individual, selected the chair. And that's worked very efficiently uh, because we're all neutral. Okay, once the arbitrator is selected, he or she will sign an oath and provide the disclosures we talked about before. Again, just because an arbitrator makes a disclosure does not necessarily mean that that arbitrator will be rejected. Parties will comment on whether they find the disclosure disqualifying. A dispute as to disqualification will leave that determination in the hands of the administrator, but typically if a party wants someone disqualified, that person will most likely be disqualified. A uh, preliminary hearing will then be scheduled once the arbitrator is selected or arbitrators are selected and they'll set a timetable to be followed leading to a final hearing. Among the matters addressed at the preliminary hearing are date, place, and time of the final hearing, 
uh, number of days to be allocated, that's very important. Typically, uh, I tell parties to ask for more days than, than the, the amount of days that you need because parties tend to underestimate. And it, once you have everybody in one place at one time, you want to finish the case. You don't want to come back setting everyone's schedule. It could be a month or two later when you do come back and you, want to, you don't want to have that gap. Uh, applicable rules to follow in the arbitration. Each organization tends to have its own set of rules. Arbitrations can also be conducted under the Federal Arbitration Act or a State Arbitration Act. Uh, the type of award to be issued. Uh, the standard award typically is a default uh, for an award and contains a, a statement of the final ruling with little or no basis or reasoning. Uh, there's a reasoned award, obviously more detailed, but also more expensive because more time is spent. And then there's the findings of fact and conclusions of law, which is sort of in between the two. And you want to also address whether the arbitrator will uh, award uh, prevailing party attorney's fees and costs. Um, discovery. Let's talk about discovery and dispositive motions. Uh, the scheduling order will call for an exchange of documents. Interrogatories, admissions, and dep depositions are not typically part of the arbitration process, but can be implemented at the discretion of the arbitrator. Uh, depending on the complexity of the case, an arbitrator may allow a limited amount of interrogatories. Uh, because the arbitration process is designed to be less costly and more expeditious, an arbitrator allowing depositions may limit depositions to the principal parties and set a time limit. For instance, just recently I allowed parties to have two depositions and one one-hour deposition of a third person if they elected to do so. Uh, in lieu of a deposition, an arbitrator can order the parties to exchange, uh, exchange a statement of expected testimony as to the witnesses intended to be called. Discovery disputes are handled as expeditiously as possible, uh, often with a telephonic hearing. What I typically do when I hear that there is a discovery uh, issue that, that has come up, a motion to compel is filed or something along those lines, I will get with the administrator and say, look, let's get a conference call in the next couple of days and let's resolve it. Prior to that call, though, I make sure I, I make it very clear to the parties I expect them to meet and try to narrow the issues. They don't, but I ask them. Uh, and, um, and then we try to, again, narrow the issues uh, with the idea of getting, keeping the case moving. You don't want to have a block in, in, in getting the case moving towards a final hearing. Dispositive motions are part of the arbitration process today, more, and they're much more common than they were, say, 10 years ago. Uh, but keep in mind that an arbitration award, uh, even an award related to a dispositive motion, is very hard to appeal. So as an arbitrator, I will will grant a dispositive motion if it's warranted, but I really think, it, think hard and long before I do so because of the, the lack of appeal opportunities. Um, experts need to be disclosed, and in lieu of an expert, expert deposition, the arbitrator can order an exchange of expert reports, including the opinions to be offered at the final hearing. Uh, preparing for the hearing. Prior to the final hearing, parties should submit final witness lists, exhibit lists, and a stipulation as to uncontested facts. The final witness lists will be reviewed by the arbitrator in order to confirm that there are no additional disclosures or conflicts uh, that have to be discussed with the parties. Anything contained on a party's final exhibit list must have been provided to the other party prior to the hearing. Again, we don't want any, any trials by ambush. To simplify the hearing, the parties should be asked to submit a joint exhibit book. That way, you don't have exhibit one over here being exhibit 12 over here. Um, and a stipulation is a very helpful tool in arbitration. It really can streamline the hearing. If the parties can agree as to certain basic facts or certain basic documents, those documents can be admitted up front with no uh, testimony relative to those documents, and again, it streamlines the hearing and makes it go much more efficiently. Uh, for more complex cases, it is advisable for the parties to file a pre-hearing brief, setting forth basic facts, factual issues, and the legal issues to be addressed at the final hearing. That way, the arbitrator is not coming into the hearing just having read the, the claim and the answer. 
Uh, he has a pretty good idea as to what to expect, and it'll again, it'll make his job easier and make the, the process much more efficient and streamlined. Uh, the parties should issue subpoenas to any potential witnesses. Subpoenas pose some interesting questions. Florida law allows an arbitrator to sign a subpoena, but what if, the, if an indiv individual that is served does not show up? As to a party to the arbitration, the arbitrator has some sanctioning ability because he can you know, limit their, uh, their recoveries or, or do something relative to the case. However, as to a non-party issue, there really isn't a sanctioning ability. And so that's sort of an interesting dilemma. Now, an arbitrator can consider the lack of co cooperation of a, a subpoenaed individual in drawing inferences regarding the testimony that is heard, especially if the arbitrator believes that the party who doesn't show up, uh, one of the parties rather, had the ability to compel the attendance of the, the party that didn't show up. Now, another question that comes up, can an individual be subpoenaed to attend a deposition? Uh, the answer is probably no, and there's some mixed case law in different jurisdictions regarding this, but chances are the answer is no. The parties need to decide if they want a transcript of the final hearing. It's not required, but if it's desired, the parties will have to make arrangements to have the court reporter present. If the parties want to have the transcript to the, uh, to the arbitrator for his review and his deliberation, again, they'll have to make those arrangements and pay for it on their own. And typically, the parties will cooperate and split the costs, but it's not required. Again, let me take a break. Okay, uh, any remaining preliminary matters, such as pre-hearing motions or unresolved dis disputes, should be addressed at the outset of the hearing. These motions can include a motion in limine or unresolved pending motions. Also, the arbitrator should flush out any issues with the parties regarding exhibits they tend to introduce. What I'd like to do at the beginning of the arbitration is ask the parties, are, there, are all the exhibits that are in these books that you've given me, are they admitted and can we just stipulate to that? And if there are specific issues, either I'll ask the party if they want to deal with them up front or they want to deal with them when the documents come up. But to the extent we can get things admitted and not have to uh, have an argument down the road, we try to do that. Um, also, I like at the beginning of a hearing to have the parties give me the road map of the case. Uh, what, when they're going to call witnesses, how much time did they anticipate the witnesses to take, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that we know going in what we can expect. Now, sometimes you have a specific time period that's set aside for a hearing, and there's a concern as to whether or not you can actually get the hearing in within that time period. An interesting idea that was brought up, not by me, but another arbitrator in a case, he was the chairman of the panel, uh, because we knew we were going to have time constraints, is he told the parties up front, I want you to tell me now if you, if you want to get it done within these four days. And if we can't get it done within the four days, are you going to want to come back at another time, or do you want to really get it done within the four days? And the general consensus and the stipulation was, no, we want it done within the four days, period. So both parties stipulate that's the time frame. So what the chairman did was he took the time, divided it in half, and both sides got half the time. What happened? Their presentations were incredibly efficient, and we actually got the case done in three and a half days. Chances are, had we let them just go, they would have gone past the four days into a fifth or sixth or seventh day, but because of the time constraint, they really became efficient, and it was a really good way of handling uh, the time situation. Um, at the beginning of the hearing, like a, like a court case, each party will be asked to make an opening statement. And like in trial, the opening statement is supposed to tell the arbitrator what the evidence will show. And like in trial, many of the opening statements will morph into a closing statement. Um, but you know that's sort of the, the way that's sort of the lay of the land and what happens. Now, setting a time limit on the opening statement is, is helpful, and uh, I typically ask the parties 
how much time do you need, and I try to hold them to the time that they, that they request up front. Again, the idea is to keep it moving along, but not to the, the detriment or the, uh, the prejudice of either party, of course. Uh, claimant puts on its case first, and like a trial, claimant's witness will testify, and they'll be cross-examined by the respondent. Uh, as an arbitrator, I have found that arbitrators tend to be a little more proactive in questioning than a, than a judge would be. Um, I tend to be very proactive because uh, sometimes attorneys don't necessarily get to the points that I want to hear. And as the trier of fact and the, the, the determiner of the case, I need to know certain things. And I will ask very pointed questions to get to the information that I want. Uh, so I tend to be very proactive as an arbitrator. Now, as to expert testimony, uh, parties will evaluate the need for an expert as the arbitrator is going to be typically more knowledgeable on a given subject than certainly a jury would be and oftentimes more than a judge would be because the reason this arbitrator is on this case is because he probably has some level of expertise in the area. For instance, when the AAA puts together a slate of arbitrators for a given case, they have keywords. And if the case is related to real estate, for instance, they're going to have arbitrators on the panel uh, on the potential panel that have a real estate background or health care or labor or something along those lines. So the arbitrator may not need an expert and it's incumbent upon the, uh, the attorneys for the parties to listen to first of all check out the arbitrator's background and to listen to the questions which is why it's good that if an arbitrator asks questions in my view uh, listen to the questions that are being asked because they can evaluate whether or not an expert is actually needed and I will tell you that there have been times in cases that I've arbitrated where after listening to the questions the the parties have decided not to put on expert testimony and in doing so saved maybe a day's worth of, of time and money for their clients uh, and still get, obviously getting to, uh, to a resolution of the case just as efficiently as if the experts had testified. And if you put on an expert in arbitration, make sure he's an expert. Because again, you have an arbitrator who probably has knowledge in the area. And myself with having a, a real estate and business background, if a guy comes up and is going to testify as to the value of a particular piece of property, and when I ask him how much is he allocated to the land, and he tells me he hasn't allocated anything to the land, he's lost all credibility with me. Because obviously a portion of the value of the property is in the land. And I know that because I have a background. But a judge, certainly a jury, may not have that knowledge and expertise, and they may just go with what the guy says. So if you're going to put an expert on, make sure he's an expert. I will tell you that I've had people come in and tell me about tax law. And I have a little bit of background in tax law. I haven't been a CPA and, and I've been practiced actually in accounting for five years. Um, if he's going to testify about tax law, he better know what he's talking about. And I'm going to ask him questions. And he's going to, he, he better have answers because if he doesn't, it's going to look bad. And I've been in situations where uh, experts have come, in fact, just a couple years ago, experts came in front of the panel and testified as to certain finance principles. And all three of the arbitrators had a pretty good background in finance. Uh, what happened? He, he was discredited. We didn't give any credence to his testimony at all, and it hurt his client. So if you're going to hire an expert, make sure he is an expert. Um, let me stop for a second. There's something else I wanted to talk about in experts. One more, one more war story on, uh, on experts. Uh, again, when an expert is named, you have to disclose your knowledge and whatever relationship you might have with that expert. And a few years ago, uh, a party wanted to put on an expert that had testified in front of me two other times. So obviously I disclosed that this party had testified in front of me two other, two, two other times. Everybody was fine with it. He was allowed to testify. As a side note, uh, I ended up ruling against his side in the case. And a couple weeks later, I saw him uh, out in public at a restaurant. And he came up to me with sort of a grim look on his face. Then he smiled and said, yeah, you were right. So, but you never know. Um, closing argument. Let's talk about closing argument for a second. Uh, it can be done orally or by written submission. 
If there's a transcript of the hearing, again, the parties are going to have to arrange for the arbitrator to receive a copy if they want him to review the transcript. Uh, oftentimes, when there's going to be a written submission, they, it, there's a time frame involved, and it is very helpful, especially in a more complicated case, for the arbitrator to have uh, the transcript. I'm actually writing a, a, an opinion right now in an arbitration, and we finished testimony sometime in, uh, some of the testimony took place in September and some in December, and now we're sitting here in February. So having the transcript in front of me to be able to review certain parts of the testimony is very, very helpful in, in my writing my opinion in the case. Um, again, the award is drafted by the arbitrator, and there are three possible forms that it would typically take. The standard award is basically as you win, you lose. Maybe a little explanation, but maybe not. Um, the reasoned award, which is a more detailed discussion of the reasoning and the reasons why the arbitrator ruled the way that he did rule or she did rule. And then there's the findings of fact and conclusions of law, which is a more truncated version of the, um, of, of the reasoned award. The findings of fact and conclusions of law were, was found in uh, real estate purchase and sale agreements, standard form agreements for many years when arbitration was the, um, was the means of dispute resolution, but it's been changed over the years. After the award, as previously stated, there is very little basis to appeal an arbitration award. Uh, Section 10 of the Federal Arbitration Act in Florida Statute 682.032 sets forth four circumstances for vacating an arbitration award, where the award was procured by corruption, fraud, or undue means, uh, where there, uh, there was arbitrator bias, where there was arbitrator misconduct, and where the arbitrator exceeded his or her powers. And, but it should be noted that Section 10 is strictly construed, meaning that any grounds for vacating an award must fit perfectly within Section 10 in order for, for it to be a basis for vacating the award. Uh, any fraud must be proven by clear and convincing evidence, not discoverable before or during the arbitration hearing by the exercise of due diligence, and must be material to an issue in the case. Instances of misconduct could include an arbitrator's refusal to hear certain evidence shown to be pertinent and material to the case, uh, refusal to postpone a hearing upon good cause shown, or failure to disclose certain relationships with the parties. Um, and a par but a party may challenge an award on the basis of there being no agreement to arbitrate, but this challenge must be made no later than the beginning of the arbitration hearing. Uh, certain arbitration administrators have implemented an internal process under limited circumstances uh, requiring certain preconditions for appellate review. Uh, the JAMS and the AAA all have procedures in place for internal appellate review. Uh, rules typically allow for review of errors of law that are material and prejudicial and findings of fact that are clearly erroneous. Uh, but in order to get into this this uh, process, typically you would have to elect to do so prior to the beginning of the actual arbitration uh, at the beginning stages. Uh, once issued, the arbitrator cannot modify the award except to correct typographical or computational errors. I'll talk about attorney's fees. Typically, in an arbitration, uh, attorney's fees are prevailing par based on a prevailing party clause. So if there is a prevailing party cause, the arbitrator would have the power to determine entitlement, but not necessarily have the power to, the, to determine the amount of fees to be awarded and costs to be awarded. Uh, that would be done by stipulation of the parties. So if the parties agree that they want the arbitrator to make that determination, he can do so, or he or she can do so. If the parties, if one party doesn't want that to happen, then they would have to go in front of a, a court to after, after entitlement is determined. Um, if the arbitrator is going to rule on fees and costs, it, would, it could be done one of two ways. You could have an evidentiary hearing in which an expert comes in, uh, reviews the, the invoices and says, yes, this is reasonable, and the other side will bring someone in, no, this is not reasonable, and, and tell you why, or it can be done by affidavit. More often than not, it's done by affidavit. Uh, again, we're thinking about uh, cost and time. 
Uh, with the court system backed up the way it is, arbitration continues to be used as an alternative means of getting a case heard, and as the AAA likes to say, better, faster, and cheaper. If you have any questions coming out of this presentation, please feel free to contact me. I'm sure someone will, will post my, my contact information, and you're welcome to give me a call. Hope you learned something today. Thank you very much.